Yeah, Mel Brooks documentary, Automat. The Automat, the horn and hard it, hard to pronounce, Automat. Uh, and it's a wonderful movie by Mel Brooks. Um, why Mel Brooks did this is because he grew up in the Automat, and a lot of people did. Uh, George did, and to some extent I did. And we want to talk about the movie, and we want to talk about the Automat. George, so nice we're on the show together talking about something so near and dear to our own life experience. True, true. Yeah, this is a documentary, but it's re it, kept, it kept me at the edge of my seat because there were every new scene talked about the history of the automat and then and how everybody was welcomed there and there was no racial discrimination, sex discrimination or, or uh, age discrimination. Everybody was welcomed. And I loved the automat. I mean, as, as I've mentioned, my uncles would come from Montclair and Fairlawn in New Jersey, and they would meet us in Manhattan at the, I think it was at the 42nd Street one, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and they would meet us, and we would come from opposite ends of Manhattan, and we'd spend a few hours there in Manhattan, and then we'd go to Horn and Hard Art Automat, and then we'd go to the, some of the museums and do things in Manhattan. So this was part of my childhood. I mean, we'd do this like maybe every other month, you know? And I'll get into my own personal thing. I love the apple pie, the, the baked beans. And at that time, I was not a vegan. I would corn beef sandwiches. And you just go and you get your nickels. And that lady was amazing. She would just give you all the nickels. And then you put, for kids, this is so much fun. You know, you're putting your nickel in there and you're turning this thing and you're getting your food. And as we've <laughs> said, it's always in this, the apple pie was always in the same place. So I always knew where that was, where the, <laughs> the baked beans and the corned beef sandwich. And, it really, really macaroni and cheese. I love that. So you can get into your thing too. But this movie explains from the earliest days when Ms. I think Mr. Horn put an ad. He was from Philadelphia. He put an ad in the New York paper to get a partner. And then he got hard art. And they started off as a bakery kind of place, you know, then moved to a restaurant. And eventually, I think 1902, if I got the date correct, they started this. Um, it, it had started in Germany, you know, the where you have these knobs that you turn. And they, they were able to get the, the hardware here and open their first horn and hard art automat. And then it just grew. I think they were like 45, 50 uh, auto, automats, you know, from horn and hard art. So I'll, I'll pass it off to you, Jay, and you can get fill in a little more than I did. Okay. Um, the remarkable thing was the technology. Uh, you, you mentioned briefly the, the knobs you turn. So there would be a, 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 a cylinder with, uh, say, half a dozen shelves on it. And each shelf could accommodate a plate of food. Um, and you would, go, you would walk in um, and you would um, either you, you had a whole stack of nickels in your pocket or you would go to the cashier and hand her a dollar. And she had this extraordinary talent of knowing how many nickels were in her hand by the weight of them. So you give her a dollar, she gave you 20 nickels, and she didn't count them. She knew what 20 nickels felt like, okay? And for a dollar, you know, you could have a pretty nice meal. And you go to the same food that you went to. Last time you want, you want a, a, a sandwich of a certain kind, you go to that cylinder over there, you put the nickels in, Maybe it's 20 cents or something. You turn the knob uh, and, and the little window opens. And now you can stick your hand into the cylinder, a little glass window, and you can stick your hand into the cylinder and pull out the food and go to a table, any table. There was no reserved seating. You just found a table, you know, you put your stuff down. Uh, and now you could, you know, walk along this large wall. In fact, the whole room was surrounded with these these walls of, of, of open of windows um, with these cylinders, you know, hundreds of them. Um, and you could have as much as you wanted. You could have it over and over again. <laughs> you could, you, and you could have your favorite dishes. And some of their dishes were actually very good. Cream spinach comes to mind. Their baked beans were famous. And as you said, they were originally a bakery. So their baked goods and pies and cakes were really very good all for, you know, cheap, a few nickels, a few nickels is all it took. And if you walked in there, you know, you could, um, 
You could stay all day and you could schmooze with your friends. You could meet your friends. Uh, you could, you know, uh, have a social experience. You could bring your family. It was safe and it was clean and it was cheap. Um, and, and, and in the meantime, once you got past the engineering and these cylinders and, and the guys in the back that filled them, you know, booked and filled them, um, think about it. There was somebody to bust the tables. Although I cannot remember whether you were expected to bust, bust the tables yourself. I, I think you were, but I'm not sure. Um, there, but there had to be somebody to clean the tables anyway. And then the lady uh, with the nickels. And that's it. Oh, and, and all the people who you never saw, you never, you never saw anything of them. You didn't know who they were behind the wall who were constantly refilling those cylinders uh, and shelves with all this food. And they probably a big kitchen, but she didn't know who they were. You never saw their face. You couldn't see their faces. So what you had was this kind of democratization. You had all these people in the melting pot, in the Lower East Side, all these people from you know, all parts of the city, all parts of the, the social spectrum and the economic spectrum, they were all there in Horn and Harding, from the rich to the poor. And they were all treated exactly the same way. They could all sit all day, lose with their friends, and, and pay 20 cents for a piece of pie, whatever it was. Um, and so uh, this was an amazing contribution to the way the city worked. And also Philadelphia. There was there were lots of them in New York, and there was some in Philadelphia. As I recall, uh, one of the two, Horn I think was focusing on Philadelphia, and Hardit was focusing on New York. But they were partners in this very successful venture, and it made money um, because it was high tech at the time in 1902. It was high tech, and it lasted. Um, gee, through the 50s. It lasted through the 50s. 1991 was the last one. Oh, 91, yeah, 40, right. 42nd, 42nd Street. 42nd Street, right. That was the their 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 flagship store, 42nd Street. Um, and so Mel Brooks decides he wants to um, give you a documentary about uh, th this company. And he finds all these people in the Horn family and the Harder family. He finds these uh, customers. He finds the, the workers. And he gives you, you know, kind of a, uh, a definition of, of who they were and what was going on here. He gives you the identity of the company and the places and the people. You know, for example, uh, they were, Horn and Harder were very kind to their employees. They treated them very well. They gave them every benefit they could possibly give them. And their employees stayed with them for decades. Sir. Uh, and that was really something. And the, and the way they cooked, the quality of the cooking. Um, the, the, the people who engineered those uh, cylinders were really expert, um, and they, they could fix them in a minute. These were not electric. It was manual, you remember? You put the coins in, you turn the knob, the whole thing swung around, no electricity, all you know, automatic, automated, <laughs> automat, without, without any electricity at all. Uh, it, was, uh, it was brilliant, and um, it, was, it was something my father took me. I used to come and help him when I was a kid, and and he would compensate me by taking me across the street, um, on I think it was Twenty Third and Broadway, uh, across the Flatiron Building. Extraordinary piece of work, and we would have um, we would have lunch at the Automat, and it was a treat. And, and I liked going, you know, downtown, and I liked going there, and I liked having lunch at the Automat, and Mel Brooks did too. He, he spent his childhood, you know, in the automat just as well. In fact, I would say millions of people spent their time uh, in the automat, rich and poor, big and little. Every single, you know, diverse group was there, speaking every language. It was an expression um, of the melting pot in New York City, which, you know, we want to know more about how that worked. Because you know, there were... You know, there are people who, you know, they like to hang out with the Irish or hang out with the Italians. But the fact is they knew the next block was something else. And so they were they were not particularly biased and prejudiced and racist. Uh, they were all in it together, all in the melting pot. And this was an expression of the melting pot. So, experience, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, what what made it so successful was it was easy. It was cheap. 
it was comfortable. Uh, and there were not a whole lot of restaurants that did all that for you. It'd be easy and cheap and comfortable. And I think the great tragedy of Horn and Hardin, they worked so hard to make a product that appealed to everyone. And all these things I'm telling you about how, you know, it supported the melting pot, that was conscious. It wasn't an accident or a coincidence. They were trying to do that, and they did it. Um, the problem was, and, and this is worth some discussion, the problem was that the city was changing. The melting pot was changing. The people who came around, you know, with, with 20 cents in their pocket, now they had $20 in their pocket. They didn't want to hang around in an automat. Um, it, you know, it got the reputation of being good, but not if you had money. And so they would go to the restaurants, and there were a lot of restaurants then, you know, talking about the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, uh, that were, you know, more luxurious. And, and Horn and Hart, it was, you know, was still Horn and Hart. Um, and then, of course, you have the, this is really worth discussing. And then you have people who would, who had no money at all, and who came in, and, and they got a glass of water, which was free, and they poured ketchup in little, in little packages. They poured the ketchup into the water, and then they little package of salt and pepper, pour that in free, and then they would have a meal for free. And they would sit there all day long with the ketchup and the salt and the pepper and the glass of water, and they would, you know, they would, they would take advantage. <clears throat> and this made it less attractive to the middle class or the lower middle class, whatever, um, who wanted to have their regular horn and heart at meal. Um, and uh, it became less attractive for them. It became uh, offensive to have these people. And there were stories in the movie. I don't know if you caught this. There were stories in the movie about how people, nut, nut, nutcase people who managed to spend all day and, and um, disrobe and walk around half naked. And, and this, was, this was really a, a downer for anybody with a family who wanted to go there. I never had that experience, but I'm sure it happened. And, and um, you know, if, if it had happened when I was there, when my father was there, uh, we would not have come back. It was, that was hard. So what you had is a deterioration of the place because, it, you know, the, they let everyone in. Nobody was born. No, they never asked you to leave. There was nobody there who could ask you to leave. It was, you know, com completely open society. It was a remarkable thing. It was a statement of Americana. It could make you patriotic just thinking about it. Yep. <clears throat> but over time, that eroded, as things do, because in some ways the society eroded. And the other thing was, um, you know, is that it got old. And they had a problem. I don't know if you caught this in the movie. They had a problem with the nickels. Everything was outfitted for nickels. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And... You know, at some point, nickels were really a chore uh, when the, that piece of pie now costs 75 cents or a dollar. Right. You had to put an awful lot of nickels in there to get your pie out. Yeah. Uh, but they could not re-engineer -re these cylinders and the slot machines for the, to, to open, the, to open the, the, uh, the shelf in the cylinder. So now instead of, uh, you know, putting in three or four nickels, you had to put in three or four times that many nickels, and it was a pain. But they couldn't fix it because there were so many machines that only took nickels. It would have cost them a fortune. And so the inflation had a lot to do, and there was a lot of inflation over the life of Horn and Hardy. Um, it had a lot to do with the, with the end of it. It was so sad, so tragic to see it go away, and I'm sure a lot of people you know, would have continued to go to Horn and Hardy. It's just that they couldn't make money with the competition, you know, and those, those things that were dragging on their bottom line. And so even though there were a lot of people who would have, would have come back, they closed. And we had, we had testimonials from various members of the family who were pretty, you know, elderly now, uh, who saw this all happening. And then, of course, you have, you know, the original Horn, the original Harder, who were you know, managers, founders, and and the next generation was then going to take over. Oh, they kept it in the family. It was not a public corporation. It was a private company. And the next generation was 
you know, as, as this happens, as it always happens, the next generation was not as skilled or motivated as the founders. So they made mistakes in the way they, you know, selected their locations and all that. So by, by as you say, by the, um, you know, by the 90s, it was over, but it started, a, it started to go downhill in the 50s and 60s. But the corporation still started some Burger Kings and things like that. I mean, they, they were still in business, but they gave up the whole automatic automatic concept. But they started doing... I, I think they just sold the locations to Burger King. I don't think they owned Burger King. I, there was a whole discussion of how Burger King displaced Horn and Harder. Whenever there was a, a Horn and Harder location, then Burger King would take over. And, and uh, you know, they had a lot... They had some really interesting footage going back to you know the turn of the century. Oh, excellent, excellent. And all excellent these people. Histor yeah. Excellent yeah. historical footage. And then they showed how all New Yorkers, it was basically an immigrant experience and African-American experience. And they showed all these people today who are, who are famous, some have passed on, right? Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a uh, Colin Powell, um, Wilson Good in Philadelphia, who became the, the mayor. I'm trying to think who else. Oh, the guy who started Starbucks. I don't remember his name. And he he has a picture of the automat on his office wall in his corner. Yeah, well, he said the automat inspired him exactly. uh, to do Starbucks. The automat. He was a kid, yeah. and uh, it it, um, it it taught him about automation. Taught taught him about re the restaurant business and. Lo and behold, he had the picture on his wall because that was where he got the idea. You know. They showed all the different players. You know, they, this guy had written a book about Horn and Hard Art. They showed him that he was an academic and he, you know, wrote a book and all the different so and a lot of the things that you had mentioned, how things went sour, you know, for Horn and Harder over time. But it was one of the things. A lot of people moved to the suburbs, you know. I mean, my family, yeah, that was the point there, that, and that was in the movie. Yeah, I mean, we we went. I mean, if my relative, my mother's family wasn't in Jersey, you know, I don't know if we would have gone in. We would have gone into Manhattan, you know, to to meet to meet them, you know. Uh, we would have stayed Howard. We used to go to Howard Johnson's in Beth Page, you know. That was the big thing for us to go to Howard Johnson's, not one and harder than that, because it was close, you know, it was like two miles away. So everything changed. You know? Horn, well, if you wanted to take your family out for a fancy dinner, you would not go to Horn and Hart. And, and then this was even before fast food. Howard Johnson's was not fast food. But my parents, that was their our favorite place was Howard Johnson's. That was a sit-down restaurant, family, family type restaurant. So things changed. I think the late 40s and 50s started this whole trend, you know. So and people moving out of the city and, and there was another factor, too. It just occurred to me. And they did mention it in the film. Yeah. Um, there was, uh, God, I'm, I'm, I can't remember the name, but there was this uh, coffee shop affair um, that, that um, it was all the, all the employees were black, everybody, chock full of nuts. Right, exactly. Chock full of nuts did not begin as coffee on the shelf of your handy Safeway. Chock full of nuts began as a coffee shop with this snake-like counter that went all the way through it. Yes. Okay, all the staff was black. Um, every single one was, you know, it was really interesting, and and it was great place. They had donuts there to die for, and and coffee, and and you would order everything at once. I'll have a coffee. I'll have a donut. I'll have a little tuna sandwich, whatever it was. They would bring it to you in seconds. And then when you said, I'd like another coffee, they would say, no, you have to go now. Um, you you could, not, could not order again. You, you only had one shot because there were so many people waiting outside to sit in your little stool along the snake-like counter that they got rid of you. Anyway, this was so popular. When I went to law school, there was one around the corner for me. And I spent untold hours in there uh, just feeding up on their food, which was very good. You chock full of nuts, yeah. Chock full of nuts. And the coffee was good enough to go commercial, you know. I don't know if it's still available in the food stores, but chock full of nuts coffee was really top of the line. Um, and, you know, you could buy it everywhere, I mean, in the food store. So point the point there, though, is that they were eating 
literally eating Chuck Belindas's lunch. Uh, the system was cheap. Uh, the staffing was cheap. Uh, it was instantaneous service. Um, people could not hang around and waste the counter space, right? That was a big difference between, uh, you know, chock full of nuts and, and horn and harder. They displaced horn and harder. And they were everywhere in Manhattan, everywhere. So I think that probably was a big factor in the, in the, in the failure of horn and harder. And what, since you mentioned coffee, what horn or hard art, I think it was hard art. He had been in, down in Louisiana and New Orleans. And they put chicory in the coffee so that he, his coffee had chicory in there, which made it unique. And that was one of the things that Horn and Hard Art really, their coffee was drew people because they people love their coffee, right? And then the little uh, tiger spouts or whatever. So in the- A nickel, early, a nickel. That was really famous. A nickel cup of coffee. A cup of coffee with the chicory in it. And it was taste so tasty. So it, that's what made Horn and Hard one of the things that made Horn and Hard Art expand so quickly, but then all the different factors, 40s, 50s, and how it went downhill from there. Yeah, the spouts with the coffee were uh, taken off statuary in, in uh, Germany or something, exactly. and they were really beautiful, and they were imported, and, and you can say, well, who cares about the spout for a coffee machine? But, but the reality is it lent a little class. Yes. And so you felt you, were, you had a little class going on in Horn and Hardy. And it was for a nickel, you know. But let me, let me ask you, you know, this is an interesting situation. Because as we said, everything changes. And there's so many things change, you know, going to the suburbs and, and uh, you know, the average income going up and people not being in the Lower East Side melting pot anymore and, and, and chock full of nuts coming to town. Or, um, strikes me, though, and it struck me during the movie, George, that had those guys been sharper, had they been a little more visionary, they would be in business today. They would be in business with the same automated devices, maybe not, not a nickel, but maybe a quarter or something. Um, and after all, we know a lot about slot machines in 2022. Um, and they could, have, they could have sold their special food products, their baked beans, their, their creamed spinach, uh, and a number of other things that were so popular, uh, as, as it was a staple for people. You know, so what are you, what are you doing? I'm going to Horn and Harder for the cream spinach. I love the cream spinach. They could have sold that. They could have frozen it. They could have been part of the whole frozen food, you know, initiative in the 50s. They didn't do any of that. Zero. They just tried, they, they tried to continue the old model without really changing it. And that killed them. So true. Yeah, you know. Sometimes and they never changed their architecture, by the way. Those tables and chairs had been there for 30, 40 years. Um, the, although the ceilings were high, remember that? That's part of the movie. And it was spacious as opposed to a lot of restaurants. Um, they never really changed the architecture. They said, well, if it was good enough for 1902, it's good enough for 1950. No, it isn't. Um, so they didn't want to spend the money. But also people who were used to, you know, that was, that was part of their mark, their brand, you know, that, that the way the architecture was their, was their brand, you know. But I think, as you said, they made some corporate mistakes and, and the whole thing went down. But there are other you know, commercial institutions that have gone down and, were proactive and still went down because the trends were cha changing so quickly. But yeah, they, they could have, they were more savvy. Akamai, they would have. Uh, maybe yeah. been able to keep it was really too bad. We, we wouldn't be having this conversation and Mel Brooks wouldn't have made his movie. Um, but on Mel Brooks, I think it's worth noting that Mel Brooks didn't have to make this movie. His, you know, his, his, <laughs> his product over the years has been comedy. Uh, uh, satire, what have you, not this. Um, but he did this purely for nostalgic purposes yeah. only. And it was because he grew up in this, and this was his generation. Yeah. And I was struck by how old he is. He has to be in his late 90s now. And yet, you know, he didn't mind taking the time to make this, quote, documentary. 
And, and probably the most fun part of the documentary, if you recall, was the very end of it, yep, where yep. he wrote a song. Exactly. Precisely. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. Yeah. No, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's it, Jay. He's, he's, he's a good singer, too. And at the end, like you said, that was, that was the way the, movie, the, 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 the documentary ended with him singing. Pretty good singing, you know. Yeah, it was. It was. It's close to his heart, you know. And so we're gonna, you and me, we're gonna sing that song now, right? Okay. I don't remember the song, now. <laughs> whatever it was. <laughs> but 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 it's close. This movie was close to my heart. I know it was close to your heart. It was close to Mel Brooks's heart and Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Colin Powell and all the other Wilson, all, all the people, the famous people, and all the other people that they didn't show. You know. Um, was very close to him because that was part of our reality, our existence when we were young. And, 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 and it, it's sort of gone now, you know. It's part of reminiscing. And that's what Mel Brooks was doing. It was nostalgia. You know, when you get, you know, I, I, I get on Facebook and I look into the community, the little blue collar community where I grew up, where we grew up in the, the little better section near the golf course. And it, it's like, it's what I grew up. I mean, I was four years old when we left Forest Hills and we, that town is nostalgic for me, you know? And just like Horn and Hard Art restaurant outings is nostalgic. But that's what Mel Brooks was doing, you know? And as you get old, you start looking back over your life. And what, what were the pluses? And for him, for you, for me, Horn and Hard Art was a real plus. It was, a, it was an experience that you don't forget even when you're in your 70s or 90s like Mel Brooks. So leave it at that. Well, I I, you know, I think you raise a very good point. You know, I, I, I'm not sure where you could say what years you could define the greatest generation at. But it was, uh, you know, arguably at the end of the war in the 40s, uh, maybe the 50s. And there were celebrities. There were heroes from the war. Uh, there was Hollywood, you know, presenting us with extraordinary talent and extraordinary movies. Uh, and for the lack of television, that defined our entertainment in those days. And radio, you know, stars in radio. And that, you know, that was, to me, was all part of that generation. And Mel Brooks was part of that generation. Um, and this, this whole movie talks about the generational shift. Because that generation is over. It was over a long time ago. Um, but it teaches us that, you know, you can hold on to the greatest generation for a while. But they're coming. They're coming for you, and uh, the new new kids are on the block. New ideas, new new trends, new new dots to connect. And uh, that's what he's really saying. I'm I'm remembering this because this was a a really good time, not only for food and horn and hearted, but in life in general. It's it's Proust, George. It's Proust. It's, it's the mem remembrance of things past. It's the Petit Madeleine through the keyhole. And so, you know, and food takes you back. Food makes you remember. And food makes you remember Horn and Hearted. And I can taste the raspberry pie right now as we speak. And, and, and my, my point, though, is that um, he, <laughs> he, he did this for nostalgia. The food is linked with the nostalgia. And all of it is linked with the passing of that generation. It was the end of a time. The end, if you will, of the melting pot, the end of, um, you know, the middle class struggling in Manhattan and, and the boroughs of New York. It was it was getting out, getting out to the suburbs, um, getting out to a, a better, more luxurious life, I guess, having more disposable income. And you want to turn your back on that. You know, you, you don't want to speak your family's native language anymore. You want to assimilate really quick. You want to get into school and enjoy the, you know, the fruits of the of the post-war America, so, um, and Horn and Hart was a you know a casualty of all that, but so was the whole generation a casualty of all of that. And by the time you get to the '60s and activism and you know and protest and Vietnam and and the failure of the federal government to respond to the you know the will of the people, that's where it started in the '60s after Kennedy was shot, um, you know. That was a different generation. And I'm sure Mel Brooks, if he were here with us today, he would agree. And uh, it, was, it was the end of whatever Horn and Hart represented. That's why the movie has so much to carry. 
the movie has so much value. It goes way beyond just the study of this one business corporation. Definitely a bigger, bigger picture, contextually bigger picture. Yeah. Very good movie. I liked it. Yeah. But what do you give it? Would you give it a 10? Yeah, I really liked it. I'll give it a 10. Personally, I liked it. It was a, for a documentary, it was a 10. I, I, I can't see anything, you know, I mean, it was a little cutesy sometimes, you know, what was her name? Lisa Hurwitz, you know, she it was funny stuff. But I mean, all in all, it was a 10. I agree. It was a 10. It was a documentary. It was an accurate documentary. It had witnesses, uh, many of whom are probably gone because they were so elderly. Uh, how long is uh, Mel Brooks going to be around? And um, it was, um, it was uh, a, a study of love. It was a study of love, George, uh, as opposed to some documentaries which are cold and, and um, you know, un, uncaring somehow. It's just, just the facts, man, just the facts. But in, the, in this, this movie, it's a study of family. It's a study of nostalgia. It's a study of love. And that's why I give it a 10 also. Yeah. Okay, there's much more to, to go on this. We have, so, we have miles to go. And there are so many movies on the deck, George. I'll talk to you after the show. We'll select another, another spate of them, and we'll talk about them and learn from them. That's because this is, this is the show is entitled Movies You Can Learn From. Thank you, George. Are we having fun yet? Yes. Thank you, Jay. This is a lot of fun to do these, yeah, and learn as well. A lot of a lot of learning. Big broaden broaden our perspectives and nostalgia. Get back to I think the way things were. You know, those of us in our age age group. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, George. Thank Aloha. You. Aloha. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.